Welcome to the ParadoxCon 2015 stream. My name is John and I will be your host for today with a long schedule of tons of fun. We're going to start off with Crusader Kings 2. We have the three year anniversary coming up and we're going to have Henrik Freyos who's next to me and Arumba talking about the game really soon. But first, I'm just going to say that there's going to be more streams today. We're going to have City Skylines coming up in roughly an hour. And then later at 5 o'clock, we're going to have Magicka 2 with several famous people playing and having fun. So... <laughs> Excellent, thank you. <laughs> All right. So the topic today is going to be Crusader Kings 2. We have been out for three years now. It's a long time. And Arumba, the guy sitting here next to me, is one of our biggest fans and one of the most hardcore players of the game. <laughs> and you have played this game for such a long time. And I heard of stories about you playing the game even before it was out, kind of trying to get into it. So what was your first experience with CK2? Well, I remember I... Um just picked up the game kind of randomly, um, just as I saw an advertisement on Steam. It was like 2012, like right after it came out. I think it was February of 2012, if I remember correctly, that the game came out. And I, I played it for about a whole year before I actually made a single video for YouTube. So um, I did the Irish Count start, start thing. I think I played as Dublin, Count of Dublin, and uh, I had no idea what I was doing. It took forever to actually learn how to play. Um, better part of the whole year. And then, I don't know, from there I just sort of figured it out. Interesting. So was it your first grand strategy game or...? Um, well, I played a lot of like real-time strategy and uh, as far as grand strategy, definitely, yeah. It was actually my very first exposure to Paradox was Crusader Kings 2. So, um. Interesting. Henrik, that was kind of a, a thing with Crusader Kings that a lot of people got into Paradox via that game. Was that kind of a thought of yours or yeah. did it just happen dynamically? I kind of hope that would be the case. So it's kind of gratifying to hear that someone who hasn't played grand strategy games at all actually kind of came into the genre through CK2. So that's, that's good to hear. Did you actually play through the tutorial or did you just jump straight into it? <laughs> no, um, I remember, um, and this, this isn't a knock against Paradox at all, but in general the forums that said don't play the tutorials, they're not very good. Just dive in, pick a country, let the game right. run, and you'll learn as you go. And uh, it, took, it took probably a little bit longer that way. I actually like played by myself and then went back to the tor tutorial at one point and right. I don't know. Like you learn I learned most of everything I learned just by playing and trying. Yeah, I'm, I'm not Failing. actually a huge fan of that kind of tutorial myself. It's more like the thing we've been doing for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but from now on, I think we're going to be doing it differently with kind of in-game advisors and stuff like that. So I see. That, that's kind of fun. So what was it about the game that really caught you exactly? You know, if you remember back, what, was well, it I different didn't, somehow or was it like... I didn't see any of the ads for the, right. uh, the dead, Seven Deadly Sins. But uh, if I had seen one of those, I know I would have definitely bought the game just based on those. <laughs> But um, I don't know, I like the idea of like the Spanish succession and like being able to, to like affect your family. Like, not like I had a desire to kill my brothers or <laughs> sisters or anything, but it just seemed like a really interesting simulation game. Um, and I've never really been a big history guy. It's not about history for me, it's all about right. alternative history. It's like doing what you want. Um, but I know there are a lot of people who play the game for the history. And uh, I, I can't say how much I've learned about history from playing both Crusader Kings 2 and other Paradox titles. But, um, yeah, it's just the, the idea that you can change the world around you is pretty cool. Right. Actually, so. interesting question. So how much of your historical knowledge do you think is accurate now that you've been playing CK and letting <laughs> that kind of teach you? Well, as everyone knows, in the year 1200, the, uh, the French conquered all of Europe. And uh, somehow it ended up <laughs> the way that it is today. I don't, I don't know. They must have had some sort of a recession. But... Um, I've learned a lot like from this, the historical starts. Like that's where I get like the most concrete knowledge is because I've noticed that Paradox does a really good job of like researching the start dates and the bookmarks are highly accurate as far as like the Stamford Bridge scenario or, or the other start dates and you know it's pretty cool. Like this is the first time I've been in Sweden and knowing where things are, like right. countries and cities, it's pretty cool. I mean, a long time ago, <laughs> I used to think Sweden and Switzerland were like the same thing. Oh, right. So you actually learned some geography, at least, from the game. A little bit, right. yeah. yeah. Like, I, can, I know what the Iberian Peninsula is. Oh, that's awesome. You know, that's I, cool. I can, somebody can say that, say Madrid. Oh, I know where that is. Toledo. You know. right. Before that, you know, I was a stereotypical American. I didn't even know where all the states were, let alone countries in <laughs> Europe. <laughs> well, I couldn't name all the American states either, probably. So. Yeah, I think there's like 50 of them. Yeah, pretty so sure. Roughly. Right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there are. Um, so why did you decide to do the, your first video about Crusader Kings? Was 
Well, um, I, at the time, I was um, transitioning out of the insurance industry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we, we got there. It took us like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I told you it would happen. Um, but I, I was transitioning out, and I was just I was really playing a lot of Crusader Kings 2, and I, I saw that there wasn't really a lot of uh, content online about how to play Crusader Kings 2 well, and thought that I could maybe fill that niche. And it's interesting, you guys were talking about niches earlier today at, here at PDXCon, and uh, I just wanted to fill that niche, you know, aggressively. <laughs> and... Um, I don't even, I, you know, actually, I remember the very first campaign I did was the Republic of Gotland, and oh, there's so much that has <laughs> changed. I almost, right. almost kind of miss some of the features from back then, because back then you could have unlimited trade posts, and if you were the leader of the, of the Republic, you could steal trade posts from your, your other patricians, which had to get nerfed. It really did. Right. But mm, it was fun. A lot of fun. So did you have all the expansions? Yes. All right. So you yeah. Tended to buy them when they came out, or like for for quite a while, I, I bought them the day they came out, and um, and then Paradox started giving them to me, <laughs> <laughs> which was right, nice. Right. However, they never did give me the the uh, the ancillary uh, DLC, like the the sound packs and, and the oh. portrait packs. But I I would buy those anyway because I wanted to see them, and I figured people would want to see them too. Um, you know, if they saw it on one of my videos, then maybe they'd buy it. So I figured I might as well buy it and promote it and. Um, a lot of it's been really, really good stuff. Oh, that's cool. But, you know, the first time you played it, did it remind you of something? Did you kind of see similarities in games that you'd played previously? Or was it just a huge shock to you, <laughs> the whole thing with the... Well, if you're asking specifically for, like, comparisons to, like, other games that yeah. come to mind, mm -hmm. the turn-based style, it wasn't turns, right? Because it's days, but each yeah. day is technically a turn. So it kind of felt like, you know kind of like like Civilization might be, but with much shorter turns, because right. each turn was a day. Um, but I hadn't really ever played a game like it. No, not before okay. Crusader, not before. Because I, I, when, I, when I designed the first game, uh, we're actually three people who designed it, I was kind of heavily inspired by The Sims, for example. The Sims? <laughs> but, yeah, okay. The Sims. Do you, did you ever think that it was kind of similar to The Sims in any way? or I guess maybe you didn't, since you didn't play like the uh. classic strategy games that are so different. Yeah, no, I was not, I mean, I played The Sims a bit, but I never got very far into it. Right. Um, I guess I can see the similarity now, thinking about it. I mean, you got the characters and the interactions between them and relationships and Personality their, traits. their opinion of each other. Yeah. yeah. So. But, um, mm, no, there's no house building in Civ. Or in, uh, <laughs> in s in no, there's country Civ building instead. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. so. But no, The Sims inspired me and uh, like a Game of Thrones, the Song of Ice and Fire novels obviously inspired me as well, even yeah. back then. So that was a huge source of inspiration. And of course, you know, classical grand strategy games like EU. We'd already done EU one and two. See, so had I had I played EU four or sorry EU three at the time, right. then um, it would have been a natural transition into Crusader Kings two. But you know what? I actually think that Crusader Kings two had such a m vastly improved interface over. Europe Universal 3, yeah. um, that that was one of the things that allowed me to get into the game. And I don't know, I mean, my, my perspective on it, EU4 took all the great things that Crusader Kings 2 did and, and used that interface and that user feedback type thing um, to make it a better game. So I never played EU3. I tried to get into it, and after playing Crusader Kings 2, I couldn't. It was just kind of clunky. And yeah, uh, no, Crusader Kings 2 was a leap forward, not just in, in the way we kind of designed the gameplay mechanics, but also, you know, graphically and interface-wise. So, you know, and still, people have a hard time getting into the game. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, there's no hand-holding and, and so on. So it's, that's an area we, you know, I personally feel we need to improve a lot still, even after E4 and so on. So, Victoria 3 confirmed then? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say that we can confirm future games. <laughs> future games are future, yeah. yeah games well are coming I, up. Yeah, the interface is, is really one of the things. I'm, everyone knows, I think, if you've watched anything. If anyone's yeah. a, watched anything I've done, it's, it's interface is like one of the most important parts. Yeah. The approachability for the, for the gamer, so they can actually understand what they're seeing on the screen. Right. But you're really concerned also about the, the minutiae, the kind of details of game mm -hmm. mechanics and how to exploit the system. And I you like know, to try to uncover optimally. <laughs> everything about the right. game. Like, like if there's a modifier in the game, like an opinion modifier, I want to know exactly why, where it came from, why it's still there. Right. You know. um, but so. if you've been playing games like that all the time, it must have been kind of frustrating to play 
a game where there are so many little details and such no. chaotic systems to... It wasn't frustrating to, at all. all right. it, was, it was like heaven. It was like, all oh, right. look at all these little things I get to obsess over. Because right. I, I really you know, liked those things. Um, all right. you know. So would you say you're, you're slightly OCD or...? <laughs> could be, could right. be. Um, mild form, maybe. Right. Un unmedicated. <laughs> It's actually so, uh, on topic of UI, so I mean, I, the UI has not changed drastically over the years, but there's sort of been improvements and changes. Has there been anything that you thought was just a great addition lately? Because, I mean, as mentioned, it's been out for three years, and that's a very long time to kind of improve and build upon the game. So has there been like anything that just felt like, oh, I, I didn't really realize I needed this, or, you know, this was just great and making things clearer? Hmm. Well, you know, it's kind of all blurring together simply because I've spent so much time playing Crusader Kings 2 and then now EU4. Um, but I, I don't know. I think Crusader Kings 2 had so many good features in it right from the beginning, like river crossing indicators and, and other things that eventually would make their way into EU4. But those were in there from the very beginning. Um, feels to me like a lot of the patches that have happened for, for Crusader Kings 2 have strictly been content-based, unlocking new playable religions and, and areas and you know, I remember when the game first came out and you could only play as a Christian nation and and uh, now you can play every single province, like every country, except Almost. for unlanded characters. <laughs> unlanded characters, next DLC. Uh, Theocracies and <laughs> inland republics. And oh, you can still do that. There's a little bit of editing in the settings and you're you, good to go. Yeah, you can, but, yeah. but you can't play like baronies either. Right, um, right, stuff. and unlanded, so, which yeah. could be a thing, maybe. It's just an idea. So which is your favorite uh, expansion? If you had uh, to pick one. It was the old gods, hands the old down. Gods, right. Yeah, um, I mean, not to say like the, the most recent one, Way of Life, wasn't really good. It's just that there's just something about raiding as a Viking, and just the raiding mechanic. I love it. I find this extremely fascinating because you know every time we add something dark and horrible, people, <laughs> people love it people the like most. It. Basically, yeah. so it's like the pagans and abducting women as concubines. People love that. Status quo. Um, it's good stuff. Serastrians and their questionable morals. People <laughs> yeah. love that. You know, or it's, it's funny, almost. That or now with Way of Life being able to seduce your mother. Your own sister. No, not your mother. You can't do that. You can't? No. I thought I could <laughs> no, sworn no. I'd seen someone do that. No, we, ha we had to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, what if you're a really? Zoroastrian, though? Can you, can you seduce your mother if you're Zoroastrian? No, I don't think you can. Uh, yeah. Looks like yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, he's saying yes, you can. What? You All right. Know. That's a bug, though. So <laughs> That's a bug? <laughs> I was not aware of that. That's not supposed to be the case. I'll have to block that. Hmm. No, we're not that depraved. <laughs> yeah. There's like, there's no number of times I could play as a Norse and like get tired of it. Like, I could just like tomorrow I could start up a brand new campaign as the Norse and do the whole raiding thing all over again, and I just love it. Um, that was definitely the best DLC. So, yeah. what's like your worst, like your worst possible starting scenario? The the place where you feel like this is just horrible. I don't want to be here. If you compare it to loving the Norse. Like where in the world would you start and just be? A lot of the Jewish starts are particularly challenging, simply because you have no other nearby natural allies. Um, the the Karen start, like as a Zoroastrian, it's fun, but it's also very challenging because you don't have any anybody to help you out nearby. It's still still doable. It, I've done it, but um, it's just it. With those starts, it's not that it's really much more difficult to succeed. It just takes longer to get the snowball started. But yeah. then once the snowball starts rolling down the hill, it's one of my only real complaints remaining about Crusader Kings 2 is that the game is too easy. Yeah. It, it's too, once you know the mechanics, once you've learned the mechanics, the challenge is gone. Because so th this is where the, this weird dichotomy exists, where new players find the game overwhelming and challenging, and they just mm -hmm. quit because they don't have an air, and it's game over. Mm -hmm. And once you learn the game mechanics, uh, if you can get past that initial hurdle, as you mm -hmm. say, the game actually becomes fairly easy, you know, and then right. too easy as you become a veteran player. Right, and especially uh, in regard to like plotting, for instance, you can kill anyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are balance issues, and uh, there is also like the classical late game issue in this type of game, where you know you know you won at a certain point, mm -hmm. and you know with us pulling back the timeline uh, from the initial start at 1066, like 300 more years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. yeah. People that that's, uh, exacerbates the problem. So it's definitely something we're looking into how to how to do that. And EU four does a better job of it with the coalition systems and the mm -hmm. stronger AI. But I think that CK two actually has a more natural inbuilt mechanic that we could you know utilize 
uh, in this regard, and that's the vassalage system, you know, the system where you have vassals mm -hmm. and you cannot hold uh, an infinite amount of territory yourself, but you have to rely on these guys. Right. Uh, so if you can if you can make the gameplay versus them more interesting and have like expectations and demands from your vassals and you need to juggle that, I think that could be the key mm -hmm. to some of these issues at least. Yeah, I like the, some of the changes I saw with Way of Life in regards to the uh, elective gavel kind and having, having vassals break free if you're over the vassal limit upon succession. I think th things like that will help people, uh, prevent people from blobbing in the game. But like I've often had people ask me, like, hey, why don't you do a grand campaign? Because that's the thing you do if you're a Paradox Gamer, is you'll do grand campaigns. I can't do that, because you give me any start, and the earliest start, 7, 768, is it now? 69. Uh, 769. Um, but you, can, you can conquer the entire world in 100 years, the entire yeah. map, um, from anywhere, really. And there's no point in doing a grand campaign if you start off controlling all of Europe and all of North Africa and... India, so no, it's it's one of my own pet peeves as well, and um, and I can't stop myself from doing that because <laughs> right. you, you learn how to do it and then yeah. you just do it. No, but it's not yeah. supposed to be that you're supposed to stop yourself from doing stuff. It's just mm -hmm. you know how the how the balance of the game is at the moment. Yeah, I guess I'm just difficult to please though because like in Victoria too, I don't like how Infamy prevents you from doing that, but then in Crusader yeah. Kings too, I don't like that you can do it. It's like I'm. Uh, it's I'm a very monster. tricky problem, and you know, many different games have tried to solve it in, in different ways. Uh, sometimes there's like a global happiness value, where your people get more upset the more powerful you become. Mm -hmm. I don't like that kind of system because I, f I feel that it's it's punishing you for playing well, and mm -hmm. it feels arbitrary and not realistic. But it does the job, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I would prefer another solution. Well, so. one thing I had tried modding at one point was um, the AI difficult, like the difficulty slider in the game. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the game setup, there's like easy, medium, hard, and um, all that that does is like affect morale and, and these values that um, I don't really think make the game any harder, actually. Like, you're, if you have it on hard, the AI makes more money. But most of the vassals you have are considered AI, so now they make more money, and then you tax them, and so you make more money, and so it doesn't really matter. What I had tried modding in was like um, just an opinion modifier where your dynasty and everyone that, like your character and your dynasty would be um, the characters that would be affected and then every other AI in the game would dislike you for being the player or for being associated with the player, mm -hmm. which would make things difficult, like um, plotting would be much harder for you or uh, it'd be much easier for the enemy to, to plot against you. Like something like that would actually slow me down, um, whereas other than that, and self-restraint, I can't really stop from wow. talking the world. It's funny that you mention it, because the AI difficulty settings have, have been on my to-do, basically, mm -hmm. since, well, 2013 at least. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I mean physically in my to-do list. <laughs> really? To look into that, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I've never gotten around to it, or I should probably delegate that to someone else now these days, but you know, mm -hmm. this needs to be done. So. People, um, you might expect that to actually happen. That no, it's. It, I don't think it'd be very difficult to do because I got I got most of the way. The tricky part was just getting it set up so that the modifier. I used a trait, just yeah. the player player as a as a trait, and uh, it was an inheritable thing. But it was ending up getting spent every all these random courtiers and. I think the the reason that it's been kind of lowest down on the to do list is basically it's a little bit of a cop out. I want the normal gameplay at normal level to mm -hmm. be balanced and good, and mm -hmm. you know we should focus on that. But you know, as a <laughs> as a uh, you know compensation, maybe you could use the AI settings. After all, they're there or the difficulty settings. Yeah, and there are some changes in the code. The AI does look at some of them for declarations of war and things like that. Being on a higher difficulty yeah, will make them but more it's, aggressive? It's, yeah, a little bit. But I don't think it's very noticeable. And mm -hmm. no one has really paid any attention to, to that yeah. part of the system. So. Well, unlike like European Universe 4, where I will bump it up to hard, yeah. because it does have a direct effect on gameplay, um, and it doesn't affect like bonuses for the AI. They don't get more money on hard yeah. AI. They're just more aggressive, and they'll coalition you. Um, I've pretty much left Crusader Kings 2 on normal, because giving them more money, or just giving them more morale, um, I don't know, it, it didn't feel the same as harder AI. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't like that kind of AI or that kind of challenge settings either because I don't want the AI to cheat and yeah. it's something we've tried to move away from ever since EU1, basically. So mm -hmm. that there should be no AI cheats remaining essentially in the game. 
if you don't use those settings, of course. Right. And again, that's why I would prefer to find solutions that actually work uh, in, in the normal difficulty settings as well. Do mm -hmm. you think you might ever do something similar to Infamy in Crusader Kings 2? I don't think so, um, because I'd rather use the opinion system that we have. Um, mm -hmm. What we might do eventually is kind of separate opinions into personal opinions and political or real politic opinions, mm -hmm. which is like, yeah, I like you personally, or I would if I ever met you, <laughs> you know, face to face. Mm -hmm. Um, but for strategic reasons, I still dislike you. So one of these opinion values might ex you know, affect declarations of war more than the other one might be like revenge, right. pers personal issues. Yeah, I, I've, like always, so. I've always found the rival system to be a bit... Underused. It's, there's not much. Like you'll, like, and this usually will happen where I'll play as a character and my character will die and then I'll be playing as his, as his heir and then come to find out that when this guy was a kid, he picked up some rival, and now he's a baron of some castle somewhere. And it's not doing much, no. So what? Like, there's no, it's nothing there, really. Yeah. No, it's definitely oh. something we're, we're currently actually expanding on, and, you know, you didn't have Way of Life, did you say that? Or I do. You, do, no. you don't have Way of Life. Mm -hmm. You might have noticed that it's, you know, there are more rivals and more and friends. And I can duel your rival. Yeah, and there's a little bit more, more stuff to do with that. And I, I want to expand that even further because I, I really like it. Mm -hmm. I would like to have like family feuds and mm -hmm. things like that going on between different dynasties, even you know after <laughs> your present character has died. Right. These other guys will still dislike you. So, there, are, there so. are some mods that do something similar to that with like, uh, like just for example, the Game of Thrones, or it might have been the other Kings mod. Where you, they've got like a tyranny trait that's inheritable. Yeah. So if your father was tyrannical, then it reflects poorly upon your dynasty. Something like that could be. Yeah. Nice. There is a case to be made for having tyranny or infamy or something in the top bar, basically, mm -hmm. as a as a flat modifier on opinions. So mm -hmm. I've toyed with the idea several times, but I'd rather kind of not do it as with, with such broad strokes. You know, some people might still like your actions, even if mm -hmm. they're like, viewed as tyrannical by others. I'd rather work in something with fear and intimidation and make you know, tyrannical gameplay viable mm -hmm. in some way. <laughs> you know, so then the, you still have the choice of uh, becoming yeah, exactly. tyrannical. So these, these are just my loose ideas. Um, I haven't really done anything about it yet, but what I can tell you is you know, some expansions are probably going to be more, you know, we call it a strategy RPG, the game. Mm -hmm. So some expansions will probably focus on the strategic part and the diplomacy and the church and mm -hmm. uh, that complexity. Um, you know, balance, these balance issues you, you talked about as well will probably go into the, those kinds of expansions. Mm -hmm. And then there is the role-playing expansions like Way of Life. And mm -hmm. I want to do more with that because we kind of neglected that part of the game. Um, I don't know if you're that kind of gamer, but m many of our players actually prefer the kind of interrelationships between the characters to mm -hmm. you know, the composition of your armies and you know, setting up alliances and, and all that stuff. Right, I have a hard time like, forcing myself not to min-max and to like, yeah. do the world conquesty type play style, but definitely like, the times that I've been the most engaged in my gameplay, in, in the actual game itself, is when I've been like, attached to the character because of their traits and the relationships and the story that's unfolding. Um, but so, so when you pick a focus, for example, in Way of Life, mm -hmm. do you pick the one that's most beneficial to you at the moment, or do you actually pick one that's fun? I've, I've forced myself to pick the fun one, but I'm, it's very difficult for me to right. not take the one that gives plus one health, because I know but, exactly but how But is it a little works. bit painful for you to, <laughs> to pick one that's not optimal for you, or yes. is it like, all right? Yes. Okay. I, I want you know, I want to take the hunter, or I want to take right. the, the the family focus, or something that gives the bus twenty five percent fertility and plus yeah. one health is huge. It's so so significant yeah. that I, I you know you, it's like you can't not have that bo that modifier. Right. Um, it's like having the strong trait on every character. Bonus one health. It's, it's huge. Yeah. Um, but I still find it you know gratifying when people say that they do that. They they pick a fun focus. Yeah. <laughs> for role-playing reasons, right. neglecting kind of what's really better for them or more beneficial for them at the moment. Right, and I'm not uh, normal. Don't don't say <laughs> I'm not the guy. Who, I'm not the normal like representative. Right. No, no, of the it's, audience, that's okay. Um, um, but you know, a lot of people have said that, and I find you know that that means that the role-playing part of the game 
right. is important as well. I do think that any kind of any kind of DLC or expansion or just patch that's made that's that adds more traits or adds more modifiers, I think those are going to be well received because players love they love traits. They really do. Yeah. Like the more traits you can throw in there, the better. The problem with that is it, it affects everything that happens in the game, and you need to make each trait basically interesting. Mm-hmm. So, for example, <laughs> I would love to have more more events for paranoia. You know, mm-hmm. and, and lunatics and uh, possessed people. Those mm-hmm. are probably the three traits actually that we worked most on. The lunatic but ones are great. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I basically tell our scripters every time we release a new expansion that you know, don't forget to put some fun lunatic and possessed and mm-hmm. paranoid event options in there, mm-hmm. because they're so much fun. If you happen to have a lunatic character. Yeah. Right. Right. You should do specific combination traits. Like if you have a lunatic who's also a dwarf. We'll have just one special <laughs> trait that can only, or one special event that can only fire under those circumstances. Yeah. Um, it's actually, you've been talking about role playing for a while, and something that's been on my mind is that since you are a person that gives a lot of feedback to the game, and we're kind of looking forward to, so in, in a dream scenario, just in you know, vague concepts, if we were to expand upon the role play part of the game, not within the current systems, but within adding new systems or new functionalities to the game, is there anything you think that could add a lot to, to the depth of the game? You know, it could be anything like more dialogue options or some kind of you know, other kind well, of gameplay layer there. What would you like to see in, in the role player? area? I would. One of, the, one of my modding, mod, you know, making mods for the game complaints had, had been, and I think this may be an engine restriction, that you only have four potential event choices on any particular event. And I could never find a solution to get past that, that limit. It was always four. Hmm. Um, and the way that other mods have handled it is they'll have submenus. So the fourth option will take you to a next you know, selection thing. Yeah. But having more choices, and having, I think, maybe more choices that are, are not... Um, like, at this point, when I play the game, I don't, I don't even read the text because I know which one to click. I know which one's going to give me the diligent trait. I know yeah. which one's going to give me the right outcome for any education trait. Um, like when I get uh, air, educating your air pop-ups. Um, some more randomness, maybe, would be good just so that you actually have to think about it. Or um, some more, you know what would be really good is if you could exclude some of the options based on your traits. Because that way you could still know what the ideal choice is. a tough one though. I mean, you have this disconnect between your character and yourself <laughs> in Crusader Kings 2. But that's where your character has a lot of traits, mm-hmm. but you're another person and you don't want to play that way. Right. right. And we haven't really solved this issue. Uh, right. For example, you know, other characters have opinions about your character, mm-hmm. uh, but in a multiplayer game, for example, that's really strange, because it's the guy behind the wheel, you know, or the puppet master, right. <laughs> they should have an opinion about, really, and, and not the puppet. That's true, um, but in, in Crusader Kings 2, you are playing the character, whereas like in, in way, EU4, yes. you're representative of the country. I almost feel like forcing the player to, to at least have to roleplay a bit would be good, because that's part of my problem, is like, I'll, I'll be a three-year-old kid world conquesting, because I can, because there's no reason that I can't. And yeah. so I'll play the game as if my character is a 30-year-old with 20 diplomacy and 20 martial score, and I you know, just you know, do what there's I want. Another, you know, that's one of those cases where we can't really limit you too much. You know, we've gone a little bit in that direction, where your regent actually interferes and won't allow you to do stuff. Right. Uh, but it's very, very dangerous, because mm-hmm. you know, players get bored if they have to wait out 15 years. <laughs> yeah, Regency <laughs> you know, that's, that's not fun. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind mm-hmm. of a bad, bad mechanic, even if it's realistic. So mm-hmm. um, those are the kind of trade-offs we have to make all the time. But for yeah. example, wouldn't like a new system on top of that say that there's an additional role-playing system? So you're a, you're a younger child. There's a you know a period of learning or whatever. There's you know a, a kind of a new intricate functionality there where you can gain new traits or learn things. Or you know you can you can add uh, even more gameplay. Uh, absolutely, the, and the, like the, the, the normal education traits also are, are very underdeveloped, and they were there at release. Uh, and they've never been improved, even mm-hmm. though they're so crucial part of the gameplay. Mm-hmm. And I find, um, like you mentioned, that they're usually very no-brainer. You know, mm-hmm. if it's if it's your intended heir, <laughs> you want him to be diligent and ambitious. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other sons or other kids you raise, they're supposed to be like content and you know happy with their situation in life, mm-hmm. but still competent. And it gets too easy, basically. Right. I don't. So. I don't find that even even a, a vassal with the ambitious trait is any difficulty to manage. Like, right? They're not. They're not very very hard. Here's just a random idea. Um, 
you know, in, in EU4, we've got Iron Man mode, which is a specific mode to make the game, like, you can't, you can't save, uh, save scum, you know, go back and reload. We have it in CK2 as well. Right, but what if, what if there was an extra option in CK2, like roleplay mode, where you, where you couldn't do those, those things? I know it would be a whole separate section of the game, but for someone like mm. me, at least, being forced to play that way would be good, and then you're still not limiting the players that don't want to play that way, because they don't have to have that on. Um, just as an idea. It's an interesting idea. Um, it's a lot of work, though. <laughs> so, right. But it's an interesting. You gotta, there's an opportunity cost thing there. Yeah. You got to try to decide if it's worthwhile. But um, role play, I think, is the reason the game has so much replayability. Because that's that's honestly the reason that I've started to lose interest or have lost interest in CK2 is that once you've conquered the world a few times, um, it, you don't want to do that anymore. And uh, it's the role play that brings you back, though. Yeah. Now that's what makes the game unique, I think, because we have made plenty of other strategy games, and there are plenty of other strategy games out there where you can conquer the world, and mm -hmm. they are they have complex mechanics, and you know you need to strategize and think. But Crusader Kings 2 is more unpredictable, and it creates stories, and that's you know what I think makes the game special, <laughs> really, mm -hmm. and memorable and why people go to our forums and write little novellas almost about their experiences in the game. Right. And I really love to read those as well. It's yeah, the uh, AAR, I can't, After Action Report. Yeah. I like to read those too. Um, another kind of random thought, have you thought about doing more with, uh, with prestige or with gold in the game? Because these are two values, these two resources that um, you know, once you get to 2,000 prestige, there's no value, really, in more prestige. Um, and then, like, in the early game, gold is so, so sparse. Like, you have very little money. But then later on in the game, you have these random courtiers who have amassed 15,000 gold. Yeah. And they just die, airless, and then all of a sudden, boom, you have 15,000 gold. There's tons of money floating around in the game in the end, and there's nothing to spend it on. And, uh, I don't know, those are just, you know, just throwing ideas out, maybe yeah. we'll see some more patches. No, it's, it's kind of... What might tend to happen in a game that's lived as long as CK2, you know, mm -hmm. that's the initial version of the game, things were a bit more balanced at least, and then with all the expansions and so on, we haven't really had time to <laughs> get these values and the, the money sinks and the prestige sinks right. quite right. Um, in newer game designs that I'm working on, you know, I kind of tend to <laughs> avoid uh, l limit less values like that, so mm -hmm. to speak, and move into more like percentages and things that have a bound. Mm -hmm. Because as you say, it's kind of hard to... S if you have prestige, which is a, a currency that you can spend, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of hard to set an upper bound without it feeling arbitrary, you know, or, mm -hmm. or deciding how much is a lot of prestige. <laughs> right. Uh, I think what does that mean? What, what is a lot? You know, it's two thousand is too low. <laughs> it's, it's, All right. it's very easy to get to two thousand. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I think my average character will get to twenty to fifty thousand pretty easily. So you get to to two in no time at all. And if you have any kind of built-up dynasty prestige, and you start your character off and he's already at five hundred, that makes succession so so easy because yeah. you know every hundred prestige gives you one opinion. So if you have just a thousand prestige upon starting your character's life, it's like having um, the diligent trait as, a, as an opinion bonus. Yeah, I know that. You know, the, there's been inflation in in vassal opinions. Yeah. When we released the game, your vassals tended to be kind of tricky to manage. Yeah. At least I remember it that way. Uh, yeah, so, but I had a sneaking suspicion that you know, for every expansion and every way that you can raise opinions and so on and probably because of prestige inflation, as you say, it's been become easier and easier to manage your vassals. Right. And they're rarely below zero, at least for any length of time. You know, so that's definitely an issue. The vassals are supposed to be much more troublesome than had, they are. Had you thought about maybe um, increasing the, the opinion range from negative 100 to positive 100? Maybe, maybe not have it capped at 100 or negative 100. Like maybe expand that range that, that people could, could actually think of each other. Because um, I think it, it just gives you more minute control over their actual opinion if, if there wasn't such mm. a narrow range. I think that could cause some other problems, though. I mean, 
Uh, people, probably. people who are like at minus thousand opinion, what can you do about them? You can only kill them. Yeah. Basically. Right. <laughs> so there's no reasonable way of accommodating them. That might not be such a bad thing, but you know, again, I want to try and move away from those kind of boundless values and, and, uh, and use scales. But you're so, right, though. Like, so. if you have opinion problems, you can just go carousing with, with your, your people. Yeah, see, so that's, that's one more thing you can do. Uh, yeah. And you can preempt bad opinions with you a family focus. And so if easy. you know what you're doing, it's too easy. Right. Basically. Right. And, you know, like, you might spend money to build a structure in, in one of your holdings, or you could be an experienced player and know that it's a good idea to just keep some money on hand so you can send gifts to everyone. Yeah. And that money is well worth it, almost always, because 20 more opinion is very significant. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I don't disagree. It's just, I think that the balance is off. That's basically, it's, it's, it's become off through, through the expansions. And we probably should focus it, on and getting see, a handle on that again. You can see how, like, basically, you were just talking about how it, Vassal opinions have been inflated over time, and then earlier I was saying how if you wanted to make the game more difficult, make the vassal, make AI dislike the player. Like, it's kind of the same thing. I'm just like if they just didn't like me by another twenty. Yeah, but see, the difference is I, I don't like the balance kind of back. global modifiers against you right. for no reason. But if the characters dislike you for discernible and obvious reasons, then that's perfectly fine, and that's how the game should work. Mm -hmm. That was always the intention with the opinion system that. You should know why this specific character dislikes me or likes me, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I want to play with. But it, that's how it should be sold, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. so. All right, so we are heading towards the end of the stream, uh, or the end of this part of the stream. But I have just one final question to both of you because, uh, okay, so once again, the game has been out for three years, but we recently just reached peak numbers last autumn, I think. We got to the top amount of players ever, so the interest for Crusader Kings is obviously globally higher than it's ever been before. Mm -hmm. So there's a future for the game. So, just shortly, how would you two personally, you, you can start on about, want to see the game evolve in, say, the coming year? What would you like to see coming? You have spoken a lot more about randomness, more role play, a bit more difficulty, but not the just artificial difficulty. Like, so where, where would you like to see the game in one year if you want to remain interested and have fun playing in it? Well, I think um, one of the things that usually brings me back to the game is the modding community. So any time I read the patch notes and there's been changes made to the game that make it easier for modders to change and, and adjust things, I think that that's a good thing. Um, and, and, I, and I've said it before, too, that I think that if there are good mods that have been created that, I mean, it says right in the Paradox forum, um, fine print that anything posted is Paradox, um, you, know, you guys own it. So I'd love to see more of the really good mod stuff be integrated into, par into the actual base game. You know, traits or, pol or events, like the dual engine. Like the dual engine mod is one of the, the best mods that there is. The ability to duel uh, another, another person while you're in combat. Like an act not, not like a duel where oh, you, you, know, you take the dual focus, then I'm going to go duel this character and you know, maybe I win, maybe I don't. Um, but like an actual like event-based duel engine in combat is is pretty cool, and if you could maybe re remove the restriction of four events, that would be another mod, another change that would really help the modding community. If they could have eight or ten or twenty or however many they want, um, it would be really pretty neat. I don't know if that's possible with the current engine, but that would be I, very nice. That should be definitely possible. Um, it's more the resolution of the screen and stuff like that that could put a limit to that or make it harder for us to make an event window that looks reasonable mm -hmm. with like 10 options or something like that. So right. it's, it's not really a hard restriction, it's just yeah. graphical. Yeah, the modding so community is, is very good at um, like modifying some of the backdrop yeah. screens to make them look appropriate. I mean, I've done it myself for right. EU4. Um, and then also, <laughs> this is a minor thing, I tried binding keyboard shortcuts to the... Uh, speaking of keyboard shortcuts, why, when are you going to add my keyboard shortcuts mod to the game? <laughs> the base game, just just throw them in there. It's All just right. it's good. Just trust me. Like, people can't play the game. If you've played the the game with my keyboard shortcuts mod, you can't go back to playing without them. Um, that's a broad statement. That, that's it's true. Yeah, it's that's true that's though. That's ask, ask anyone who's right. used them. Like, whenever whenever there's a big patch that comes out and, and the mod gets broken for a, like a couple hours before I get it patched, there are people already immediately complaining. Like, when is this going to be fixed? When is it going to be fixed? I cannot right. play without it. Um, 
keyboard shortcuts make the game so much better, especially for They're gaming. probably right about that. We're going to take a look at that. All right, <laughs> so <laughs> final note from you, Henrik. Well, where, where do you see the game I, in the coming year? I can't really say too much because, you know, I'm, Secrets. <laughs> you know it's under wraps. Um, but I kind of hinted at it before in this interview or this talk that um, there will be expansions focusing on the role-playing aspects of the game, and there will be expansions focusing on the strategic, classic strategy game parts of the game. Um, balancing is becoming an issue, yes, but you know, if we do anything about that, it's going to be in the free part of the patch that accompanies every expansion that we release, basically. So, um, yeah, more, more role-playing, <laughs> more, uh, more complex diplomacy, probably, to be expected. That sounds great. So yeah. with that finishing note, I would like to thank you, Henrik. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining me today. It's been lovely <laughs> listening to you guys talk. Thanks uh, for honey. <laughs> uh, for you guys watching and gals for that matter we are going to be right back we're going to have a short break and then in a bit less than 15 minutes we're going to have city skylines we're going to have marina and quill 18 talking about the game we're going to show it some bit and we are going to deep in deep <laughs> dive into that game so stay tuned we're going to be right back with more from paradox con 15